The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Dear friends, in this Lenten season, we have heard again how our Lord walked the path of suffering, which led him to the cross for our salvation. We have also heard our Lord's call to intensify our struggle against sin, death, and the devil, all that keeps us from loving God and one another. This is the struggle to which we were committed at baptism. God's forgiveness and the power of his spirit to amend our lives continue with us because of his love for us in Jesus, our Savior. Within the family of the church, God never wearies of giving peace and new life. In the absolution, we receive forgiveness as from God himself. This absolution we should not doubt but firmly believe that our sins are thus forgiven before God in heaven for it comes to us in the name and by the command of our Lord. We who receive God's love for us in Jesus are called to love one another, to be servants to each other, as Jesus became our servant. In Holy Communion, the members of Christ's body participate most intimately in his love. Remembering our Lord's Last Supper with his disciples, we eat the bread and drink the cup of this meal. Together we receive the Lord's gift of his body and blood for forgiveness and participate in that new covenant that makes us one with him and one another. The Lord's Supper is the promise of the great banquet we will share with all the faithful when our Lord returns, the joyous culmination of our reconciliation with God and each other. I invite you to please stand. Let us confess our sins to God and ask for his forgiveness. Almighty God, merciful Father, I confess to you that I have not loved you with all my heart. In what I have done and left undone, I have pursued my ways instead of your ways. I have not loved my brothers and sisters as myself. For this, I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. I am truly sorry for my sins. I repent of them. I beg for your mercy, O Lord. Forgive us for the sake of Jesus Christ, who suffered and died for us. Cleanse me from my sins. Release me from my guilt. Grant me your Holy Spirit to amend my sinful life. The Almighty God has been merciful to us and has sent his Son to die for all. For his sake, God forgives our sins and calls us from darkness to his marvelous light. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ has forgiven us and reconciled us to God. And he has promised us the power to forgive and love each other. Relying on his promise, therefore, be reconciled with one another. Brothers and sisters, may the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, in our words, and in our actions. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, in the sacrament of Holy Communion, you give us your true body and blood as a remembrance of your suffering and death on the cross. Grant us so firmly to believe your words and promise that we may always partake of this sacrament to our eternal good. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated.
Our first scripture reading this evening comes from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 11. The account of the institution of the Lord's Supper is recorded in four places in the scriptures, in three of the Gospels, and then here in this letter to the Corinthians. It's a reminder that just as the Lord taught those other disciples face-to-face these most important things, he also delivered these most important things to the Apostle Paul as well. In fact, it's Paul who gives us perhaps the most thorough discussion of the Lord's Supper for our benefit. So please listen. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. The Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the meal, he also took the cup saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the Lord's body and blood. Instead, let a person examine himself, and after doing so, Let him eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For if anyone eats and drinks in an unworthy way, because he does not recognize the Lord's body, he eats and drinks judgment on himself. Because of this, many among you are weak and sick, and quite a few have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not be undergoing judgment. However, when we undergo judgment, we are being disciplined by the Lord so that we may not be condemned with the world. The word of the Lord. Our gospel reading this evening comes from John chapter 13. It takes us to the upper room on the night that Jesus was betrayed. This night we call Monday Thursday. It's interesting, I suppose, that John is the one who gives us the most details about all the conversation that took place in the upper room that evening. But he's the only gospel writer who doesn't record for us the institution of the Lord's Supper. However, as he begins this section, he paints for us this picture of Jesus showing him in the very role that he wants to be seen as the servant, the one who came for us and for our salvation. Since this is the gospel of our Lord, I invite you to please stand for the reading. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved those who were his own in the world, he loved them to the end. By the time the supper took place, the devil had already put the idea into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. He got up from the supper and laid aside his outer garment. He took a towel and tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, You do not understand what I am doing now. But later you will understand. Peter told him, You will never, ever wash my feet. Jesus replied, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Lord, not just my feet, Simon Peter replied, but also my hands and my head. Jesus told him, A person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet, but his body is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Indeed, he knew who was going to betray him. That is why he said, not all of you are clean. After Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer garment, he reclined at the table again. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord. You are right because I am. Now if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Yes, I have given you an example so that you also would do just as I have done for you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Please be seated. We'll join in our next hymn.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus, dear friends. The part of God's word that we'll give our attention to this evening comes from the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 12. It takes us back to the time that God's people were slaves in Egypt, back to him sending the plagues and especially to that final plague and the institution of that Passover celebration. But before we get to all of those things, I want to start with these verses. It says, Do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. What is more important or more powerful? The shadow or the reality? The shadow of the thing or the thing itself? Well, here in chapter 2 of his letter to the Colossians, the Apostle Paul gathers together all of the various Old Testament ceremonial regulations and says that they are all shadows of things to come. So this would include Sabbath day rules. It would include the dietary laws. It would include the concepts of clean and unclean, the prescribed sacrifices, the worship festivals, and so much more. The Passover itself was one of these things. A shadow. The blood of the Passover lamb pointed ahead to the reality of Christ, the Lamb of God who shed his blood for us. And so every time that we receive the Lord's Supper, as we will tonight, we're not receiving a shadow or a picture, but a reality. But do we always fully appreciate that? Do we always see it that way? You know, as we will listen in just a little bit to the Lord's instructions for the celebration of that very first Passover, you'll see that it was all very real. The danger that existed, the deliverance that God promised, the devotion from his people that God desired, it was all very real. But even so, the Apostle Paul says it was just a shadow of an even greater reality that was yet to come. So tonight, we want to see how this shadow of the Passover helps us to better appreciate the reality 
of the Lord's Supper. Listen to the account from Exodus chapter 12. The Lord told Moses and Aaron this in the land of Egypt. This month is to be the beginning of your calendar. It is to be the first month of the year for you. Tell the entire Israelite community that on the tenth day of this month, they are to take a lamb or a young goat for themselves, according to their father's households, one lamb per household. But if the household is too small for a whole lamb, then that person and his neighbor next door to him must select one based on the number of people. Determine what size lamb is needed according to how much each person will eat. Your lamb must be unblemished, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or the goats. You are to keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembly of the Israelite community is to slaughter the lambs at sunset. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses where they eat the lamb. That night they shall eat the meat that has been roasted over a fire, along with unleavened bread. They shall eat it with bitter herbs. Do not eat it raw or boiled in water, but roasted over a fire, with its head, its legs, and its internal organs. You shall not leave any of it until the morning. Whatever remains until the morning you shall burn in the fire. And this is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, ready for travel, your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For on that night I will pass through the land of Egypt. I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both people and animals. Against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. There will be no plague among you to destroy you when I strike down the land of Egypt. This day shall be a memorial for you, and you are to celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you must celebrate it as a permanent regulation. This is the word of our God. God said, on that night, I will pass through the land of Egypt. I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both people and animals. Against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The danger was real. I mean, when God announced this final plague that he was getting ready to send on the land of Egypt, you can bet that his people took notice. I mean, up to this point in time, the plagues that God had sent, well, they were inconvenient for the people. They brought some discomfort. There was loss of cattle and loss of crops, illness and the frightening darkness. But there had been no loss of life. But now... God announces that the firstborn in every household in Egypt will die. From the firstborn in Pharaoh's house to the firstborn in the houses of the slaves. Even the firstborn among the cattle, God says, we're going to go. Back in chapter 11 of this book, God had said that there was going to be loud wailing in Egypt such as there had never been before and would never be again. We understand why. Moses and the Israelites had no reason to doubt what God had promised. I mean, already by this time, God had sent nine plagues on the land. He had promised that ahead, ahead of time, and each of them had come to pass just as God had said. The danger was real. For every single family in the land of Egypt that night, the danger was real. God's judgment was coming. And if anyone doubted whether or not God was serious about that, they only needed to check his track record of keeping his word. Do we always understand the real danger of God's judgment? 
the threats that God makes regarding our sin are just as real, just as clear as the promised plagues that he made for Egypt. I mean, think back to the very beginning. God told Adam and Eve, when you eat of it, when you sin by disobeying my command, you will surely die. And God never changed his mind about that. Later on, the prophet Ezekiel would tell God's people, the soul who sins is the one who will die. Through the apostle Paul, God says, for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. And the wages of sin is death. The danger is real. However, since God doesn't usually immediately carry out the sentence, it can be real easy for us to grow complacent with sin. I mean, it's not as if God is sending the destroying angel through our neighborhoods and striking people down. Because of God's patience, we can begin to underestimate or overlook the real danger. Maybe we lose our sense of urgency at times and think, you know, there will be plenty of time later on to repent of these sins. Or maybe we start to convince ourselves that the sins that we commit are really not so serious as to warrant something like God's wrath and punishment and all of that. But we shouldn't abuse God's patience. I mean, the final plague reminds us that our time of grace is not going to last forever. In fact, every time we approach this table for the Lord's Supper, we're acknowledging that the danger is real. We're acknowledging that there are real consequences for sin. We're acknowledging that blood has to be shed in order to pay for sin. I mean, the primary purpose of this sacrament is to address the eternal danger that our sin brings about. If the danger were not real, why would we come? Why would we bother? Blood has to be shed in order to pay for sin. Real danger requires real deliverance. So God said to his people that they were to take a lamb for themselves. God laid out the plan for the deliverance of his people who were slaves in Egypt. Take a lamb for yourselves, a year-old male without any blemish or defect. Then they were to take that lamb and slaughter it and take some of the blood from that lamb and paint it around the door frames of their homes. That way, when that destroying angel came through the land of Egypt, he would see the blood marking the homes of God's people and pass over them. It would be spared from God's judgment. Their deliverance was based on a promise. It wasn't their doing that spared them from this final plague. It was God's promise that their faith took hold of and acted on. And God kept his word. But still, can you imagine? Can you imagine being one of those firstborn in one of the households in Egypt that night? Can you imagine how closely mom and dad were holding the firstborn in their homes as they began hearing the cries coming from the homes of the Egyptians? Can you imagine them hearing the wailing from the homes around them and then having that sense of relief and recognition as they realized that their firstborn was safe. The deliverance was real. God kept his word and the lives that continued in the households of his people was evidence of that. The deliverance that God has promised us follows the pattern of that shadow. 
Christ, the perfect Lamb of God, sheds his blood to cleanse us from sin, to cover us and spare us from God's judgment. Every time we come to the Lord's Supper, we enjoy that salvation, that reality, right? We receive the very body and blood of the Lord Jesus, the very price he paid to win our redemption. This is no picture or shadow, but a reality. This isn't like the Passover observance that the Israelites would celebrate now for the next 1,500 years, where once a year they would take a day to remember how God had once long ago delivered their ancestors from their slavery in Egypt. No, every time we gather for the sacrament, when we eat and we drink, we are receiving each and every time a present reality. When Jesus says, take and eat, take and drink, he tells us, this is the new covenant in my blood. This is real forgiveness that you are receiving. This is real deliverance from sin, death, and hell each and every time. As we partake in this life-giving sacrament, we don't hear the cries of the people in the world around us who are perishing because they are not covered by the blood of the Lamb as we are. But it is happening. It's one of the reasons why the truths that we proclaim at this altar have to be shared with the world. In one of our great mission hymns, we say, Let none hear you idly saying, There is nothing I can do while the multitudes are dying. And the Master calls for you. Thanks to Jesus and the blood that he shed for us, there is life in our homes. Life that will continue for all eternity. Let's use these lives that God has spared to share the good news of his deliverance through Jesus for all the world. The real deliverance that God has provided to us requires real devotion from us. For God's Old Testament people, that meant strict observance to all of the Passover regulations. It began with the change in their annual calendar. I mean, so important was this event in the history of God's people that he said, from now on, I want this month to be for you the very first month. In other words, God's deliverance was to be the starting point for their whole life. On top of that, in this celebration, God gave them all kinds of opportunities to remember the great deliverance that he had provided for them. They ate those bitter herbs along with the meal to remember the bitter suffering that God had rescued them from. They ate that bread without yeast. In fact, they were to clear their whole home of any yeast that might be there, to re be reminded of God's promise to cleanse them from their sin and his desire that they keep that sin out of their lives. God also wanted his people to and I have a sense of readiness as they ate, watchfulness or urgency. He told them, this is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, ready for travel, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste, it is the Lord's Passover. He wanted his people ready to move forward into that new freedom that he was providing for them and to look forward to the new land that he would give them in Canaan. God also told them, This day shall be a memorial for you, and you are to celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you must celebrate it as a permanent regulation. So each and every year, the people were to reenact this Passover celebration, carefully adhering to all the regulations that God had given them. Real deliverance from God required real devotion from his people. Now our celebration of the Lord's Supper is a lot less 
involved than that, right? It's a lot simpler than that. And the simplicity, I suppose, or perhaps is God's way of reminding us that this is all his gift to us. That we can rest from our work because of the work that Jesus has already done for us. Our Lord just simply comes and says, take and eat, take and drink. This is for you. Even so, God still desires real devotion from us as his people for the deliverance that he has provided. As we prepare for this sacrament, God wants us to remember the bitter suffering that he rescued us from and the bitter suffering that he endured in order to do so. He wants us to carefully examine our hearts and lives to see the great need that we have for what he offers us here. And he wants us to trust that he has cleansed us completely from each and every sin. He doesn't tell us to sweep our houses clean of any yeast or anything like that. But he does desire that we devote ourselves entirely to him with holy lives. And so we leave the meal each time knowing that we're forgiven and refreshed for our service to the Lord. Ready to devote ourselves to battling temptation, sticking away from that sin that so easily entangles us. We also demonstrate our devotion in the regularity of our attendance here. You know, for God's people Israel, he said once a year, I want you to celebrate this Passover meal. But for us, us, he says, do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. He wants us to understand that this meal is his regular gift to us to give us the spiritual nourishment that we need to carry out whatever he calls us to do in this life and to carry us through on to eternal life. Just as his Old Testament people were to be ready to journey out into that wilderness and still keep their focus on the promised land that God had in mind for them, God wants us to be ready for whatever our journey in life might entail, while all the while keeping our eyes fixed on the eternal home that he has prepared for us. Our regular visits to this table is what inspires and fuels our faithful devotion to God and his promises. And so not just today or tonight, but every time that we gather for this meal, let's remember how the shadow of the Passover helps us to better appreciate the reality of the Lord's Supper. Real danger, to be sure, but also real deliverance from our God that inspires real devotion from us. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, let's rejoice in the reality that is ours in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We will continue by gathering our offering.
We will continue with prayer. Please join your hearts with mine. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you humble and heartfelt thanks for fulfilling your promise to establish a new covenant through the blood of your Son, Jesus. Precious Savior, both priest and offering, awe and wonder fill our hearts as we partake of your body given for us and your blood shed for us. We praise you, bless you, and adore you. In our poverty of righteousness, we have nothing to offer. Without your tremendous sacrifice, we would still be in our sins. But through your sacrament of the New Testament, we are assured that our wickedness is forgiven and our sins are no longer remembered. Holy Spirit, dwell within us as we remember our Lord's death in this sacrament. Enter our hearts to strengthen our faith and fill us with gratitude for your great mercy. Move us to encourage one another to love and to do good works. As our Lord served us, so may we also humbly serve one another. Help us live our lives as sacrifices of thanksgiving to him who first loved us. Dear Father in heaven, we come before you tonight also on behalf of Georgetta Sellen, the sister of our member Jerry Lemler, who's experiencing heart difficulties right now. We ask, Lord, that you would give her strength during this difficult time. According to your grace and mercy, we ask for healing, but especially, Lord, we ask that you be at her side. Reassure her daily of your presence with her, of your perfect love for her, and of your eternal plans for her. We ask this in Jesus' name, and we join in the prayer that he taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to please stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He made his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Please be seated.
I invite you then to come forward at the usher's direction and receive with believing hearts the very body and blood of our Lord Jesus. Come then, for all things are now ready.
Thank you.
We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this Holy Supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We'll join together in our closing hymn. Please note that the soloist will sing verse 1. Good evening again. Very nice to see all of you tonight. Uh, special thanks to our choir, our soloist, our flautist as well. Uh, so happy to have you beautify our, our worship that way. Um, no real announcements. Just please make plans to join us tomorrow for our Good Friday services, 1 p.m. down at the South Campus, uh, 6.30 p.m. here at the North Campus. God's blessings on the remainder of your evening. I'll greet you in the back. <laughs>